me to Matthew uh, chapter 22. The gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 22, and we're going to start reading at verse 35, and we'll read down uh, to the 40th verse. Matthew chapter 22, begin our reading at verse 35, and then we'll read down to uh, the 40th verse. If you haven't, say amen. amen. If you're still looking for it, say help. Amen. <laughs> And I help us then. Uh, and it reads, it says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Let me read that 37th verse again. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We started a series before the great blizzard of April 2018. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hallelujah. Called Favor and Spirituality. Favor and Spirituality. And it was a three-part uh, sermon series uh, where we're going to deal with our, our love toward God, uh, our love toward ourselves, and then our love toward others. Uh, Dr. Crawford was going to preach the message on uh, our love for ourselves, uh, but unfortunately we got stoned out. Hallelujah. Uh, next year I think we need to figure out a way, uh, my wife was telling me, uh, we need to figure out a way to, what did what, you go? To live stream. If we're not uh, going to be able to be here, we can live stream. My wife is always thinking up things. Facebook, yeah, Facebook Live, something just as simple as that. Well, we started the, the sermon series by talking about the importance of us loving God completely. And we said that we can learn to love God completely because of the simple fact that God chose to love us. Uh, he didn't have to love us, He chose to love us. And in response to his great love toward us, we should love him uh, just the same. And the challenge for us as believers to love God completely uh, uh, is, is remedied by us knowing who God is. If I know God, then I can't help but love God. If I know what he's done for me, if I know the sacrifice that he made, uh, to uh, win me back to himself, to reconcile me, uh, to place me in a place of right relationship with him, then there's no way that I can't love him. When I see what he has sacrificed on my behalf, what he has given so that I might have life and have it more abundantly, I can't help but love him. Uh, so we, we need to know God uh, more clearly. And, and how do we know God? We know God by applying ourselves to the word. We know God by applying ourselves to seasons of prayer. We know God by applying ourselves to seasons of quietness and reflection so that God uh, can reveal himself to us. Secondly, we talked about the fact that once I know him better, then I should love him more dearly. He should become the passion of my life, the passion of my heart. You know, I enjoy so much watching my son. You know, the, the, the scripture says, uh, to whom much is forgiven, uh, uh, those, those to whom much is forgiven, those are the ones who love much. Uh, my son got into some stuff, and I won't go into some, uh, the stuff that he got himself into, but I love his passion for God. He is so excited about God and his personal relationship with God right now. It's contagious. You know, I, I love being around him because he inspires me. He reminds me of where I was when I first gave my life to Christ. And, and, and we need to love God dearly. Don't let the, the flame get snuffed out. 
Uh, uh, don't let the, uh, the, the passion that we have in Christ uh, get pushed aside uh, by other things that come in to claim its attention. We need to keep, keep passionate for God. Uh, we need to have the same passion that we had when we first met him needs to be the rule of our lives. I'm passionate for Jesus. Passionate for Jesus. And then thirdly, we said that if we really love God completely, uh, we're going to follow him more nearly. We're going to be obedient. We're going to be obedient to what he says. We're going to do the things he said. And we quoted that scripture from John 14, 21. It says, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me, I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Isn't it interesting to, to note that God says the way that I can prove that I love him is by obeying him. My actions speak much louder than my words. Uh, so when I am in obedience to what God is saying and what God is directing in my life, then I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Last Sunday, we were going to deal with the topic of, of loving ourselves. And, and we uh, firmly believe that for a person to be able to love others effectively, he must first love God completely and then he must learn to love himself. You know, some of us don't love ourselves. You know, some of us, because some of the things that may have happened in our, in our lives, uh, we have a negative opinion of who we are. But scripture plainly states in, in Psalm uh, 139, in, in verse 14, he says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And as believers in Christ, I think it's time that we get to the place where we begin to believe what God says about us, and we begin to abandon what people say about us. As believers in Christ, I believe that we need to get to the place where we begin to believe what God says about us, and we don't listen intently to what our mind says about us. We need to get to the place where we really believe what God says about us. Well, what does God say about us? He says that I'm the head, and I'm not the tail, that I'm above only, and I'm not beneath. He says that I am more than a conqueror. Not just a conqueror, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. He, he says that I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm rich this morning because I'm an heir of God and I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to understand what God says about us. I am a friend of God. He's my friend. Hallelujah. And I believe that it's, it's uh, necessary for us, if we're going to effectively love others, that we first learn how to love ourselves. Say amen, somebody. Amen. This morning, we want to talk about the importance of loving others compassionately. Not only are we to love God and love ourselves, but we are to love others compassionately. You know, sometimes in the church setting, we lose that last part. Uh, we, we, we love God completely. We get to know him and we learn to love ourselves because we begin to embrace what God has said about us. And we, and we begin to, to, to push away from ourselves those things that other people have said about us. But sometimes we forget after we get our fire insurance. Come on, somebody. After we know that we're on our way to glory, we forget about those that are outside. And God challenges us in the word. He says that the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So it's important for us this morning to recognize that yes, I do love God. Yes, I do love myself, but I'm not done yet. Uh, the love of God should compel me to love, love others compassionately. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So this morning, I want to share three things that will help us to become more effective in loving others compassionately. How many of you all want to uh, become more effective in loving, loving others compassionately? Every hand in the building should be. Uh, your hand is not up. I, I, I just take for granted it's broken. Hallelujah. <laughs> the arm is broken, and that's why 
The hand is not a, a, a three things that will help us to love God or love others more compassionately. The first one is we need to know what we are. Do you know what you are? Not who we are, but what you are. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, uh, which records the very last moments of Jesus before he's caught up into heaven, uh, even though the disciples have seen him resurrected, uh, they've been with him for 40 consecutive days, uh, they've seen him perform miracle after miracle even after his resurrection, they're still asking him about the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. And as they're standing on the mount, the disciples say to Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're caught up on something that they should not be caught up on. And Jesus re responds to them, it ain't none of your business. Well, he didn't say it like that. Uh, but but the, 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 the thing that he was trying to get across to them, he said, uh, the times and the seasons uh, uh, of that information are in the Father's authority. Uh, he said, don't worry yourself about that. That's not what is most important to you and for you at this particular juncture in your experience. Uh, what's, what's important mostly is he, he, he states it. He says, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses. witnesses. You shall be witnesses. So what are we? We are? Oh, I can't hear you. We are? Witnesses. Uh, one more time. We are? Witnesses. We are witnesses. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Witnesses. It's important for us to realize this morning that it doesn't say that we should we shall witness. It says that we are witnesses. Uh, this is not about what we do. This is about who we are. I am a witness. You are a witness. We are witnesses for Christ. We can't escape it. And as a result of my personal relationship with Christ, I immediately become a witness. Well, a witness of what? I become a witness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I become a witness to the fact that Christ came down from heaven, died on the cross, and rose again so that I might have life and have it more abundantly. I am a witness this morning. Turn to your neighbor, look him in the eye, and say, you are a witness. Right. Turn to your other neighbor on the other side and say, you are a witness. So it's important for us to realize this morning that a being a witness is not something that I do, it's something that I am. I'm a witness. You're a witness. We're all witnesses. We're witnessing every moment of our lives. On our jobs, in our homes, at the party, on the way to and from work, in our interactions with people in our neighborhood, we are witnesses. And people are reading your book. They're reading your book. Every moment, especially if, if you've claimed Christianity, then they're really reading your book. I tell the story all the time. I'm going to tell it again this morning. I remember when I gave my life to Christ, I was working for Jewel Food Stores in Chicago, and I had told everybody I was a witness. I was just real passionate about sharing my faith in Christ, and I was downstairs. We were cutting the load. That's before uh, they stamped the load. Uh, before it comes to you, we were cutting the load and we were stamping the, uh, the prices on the cans of food. And, and I was the cutter that day because I had the most seniority. I was cutting these big cans of, of, of b and baked beans. You know those big cans? Big cans. They were 89 cents back then. <laughs> and there were, let me see, there were 12, no, 9 and 9. There were 18 of them. And so I cut the box in the middle really quickly and, and I was rolling it down to the shoe to the guy who would take the 89 cent stamp and stamp it. 
We were flying. And, and as, as, the, uh, as I cut it and I rolled it, it hit a bump in the conveyor, in the, in the thing, and it fell off and fell on my foot. And I cuss. <laughs> My old Adamic nature came up. I cussed. I cussed a lot too. As I, oh, oh, oh. And you know what my fellow workers did? And you said that you were a Christian. How can you be a Christian and use that kind of language? The, the point is, is that they were watching me. Mm. They heard my claim. They wanted to see my life. And so we, this morning, must recognize and realize that we are witnesses. Witnesses. Last night, my, my son-in-law, Dr. Crawford, had the opportunity to go see the um, Timber Bulls. I call them the Timber Bulls oh. now. Because they have three guys from the Bulls on their team. Uh, I got the best of both worlds. I'm from Chicago, so now I can read for the Timber Wolves and the Bulls at the same time. The Timber. But he went to see the Timber Bulls last night as they were playing the Houston Rockets. And uh, he was a witness of the beating <laughs> that the Timber Bulls put on the Houston Rockets. I mean, when I got home and saw the second half of the game, I was in shock. I said, this is not the Timberwolves. These are the Timberwolves. <laughs> but my son-in-law, Dr. Crawford, was a witness. He saw the event. He witnessed the event. The, the transliteration of the word uh, used, uh, uh, therefore, witness, uh, comes from a, a, a Greek word, martus. And the word literally means to be a witness of an event, to see something, to see something. So we have received a command from the Lord to be a witness. And the implication is for all believers. All of us are witnesses. I don't care if you're shy. You're a witness. I don't care if you're introverted. You're a witness. If you're extroverted, you're a witness. I don't care if you can't talk good, you're a witness. You know, we are witnesses, and we need to grasp that fact. The fact that we are witnesses applies to, new, to the new Christian community in the same way it applied to the Old Testament community. You know, the Jews were called to be witnesses to the rest of the nations. They failed miserably at their jobs, but we have been empowered with the Holy Spirit, so we can accomplish the task that Christ has given us. What does it say? But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So we're witnesses. Everybody say that. We are, we are. witnesses. One more time. We are Witnesses. So that's what we are. I'm a witness. You should be a witness for Jesus. You should be a witness for the Lord. That's an old song that my wife and I used to sing. <laughs> Second thing is what we believe. Not only do we need to know what we are, but we need to know what we believe because if we really believe what we say we believe, that will cause our witness to become vocal. If I really believe what I say I believe, then my witness doesn't just remain that which they can see, but it becomes something that I also will speak about. Well, three things that we, we believe. First of all, we believe that people matter to God. Isn't, isn't that our, we are witnesses who believe that people matter to God. Well, how much did people matter to God? They mattered so much to God that he did something about it. What, what did he do? God gave his son because people mattered to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. People mattered so much to God that God gave his best. 
People matter so much to God that, that, that deity took on humanity. Uh, that God robed himself in human flesh. In, in Ephesians it says it this way. It says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in form God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of flesh. And being found in flesh, he humbled himself and suffered the death of the cross. He took on flesh. Uh, people mattered so much to God that the divine, the infinite, the unapproachable took on human flesh so that he could come down here and redeem me. People matter to God. People matter to God. People matter so much to God that that, that divine being who was fully man and fully God gave his life. Well, what did Jesus say? And I quote this all the time. No man takes my life from me. But I lay it down with myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. People mattered so much to God that Jesus, who was fully human and understood the despicable, humiliating, painful death that he would experience to reconcile us to himself, willingly laid down his life so that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Let me find my place again. Jesus was buried in the tomb and rose on the third day because people matter to God. Second thing we believe because we believe that people have an eternal destination. Turn to your neighbor and say, people have an eternal destination. I'll turn to your other neighbor because we need to know this. People have an eternal destination. There you go. You got faith in Hallelujah. Man created in the image and the likeness of God was created with a soul. All completely different from the rest of creation created in advance of him. And because of the presence of a soul, we are able to interact with God. We are able to be in relationship with God. A spirit, I'm sorry. We are able to be in relationship with God. And uh, God created us not for time, but for eternity. Uh, we have an eternal spirit. We have an eternal soul. It, it lives on beyond my body. Uh, that, that's why scripture says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My body may decay, but my spirit and my soul lives on for eternity. And if we believe that people have an eternal soul, an eternal spirit, then, then we must also believe what Jesus said. He that believeth in me shall live, but he that believeth not shall perish. Now, I can't wrap my head around it, but Scripture says that those who don't embrace him as Lord and Savior are going to be separated from him throughout eternity in hell, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I can't wrap my head around that. Uh, but but I, I shouldn't be able to because I'm finite. He's infinite. I, I take him at his word. And if I believe this morning that, that men have an eternal destination that they're going to, it makes the, the matter of my witness an urgent matter. An urgent matter. If, if the fate of man is coupled with his decision that he makes about Christ, then my witness has become urgent. Because I have family members that don't know Jesus. I have cousins and relatives that don't know Jesus. I have friends that don't know Jesus. And my witness becomes urgent because I know and I recognize 
that if Vincent Todd, my boyhood friend, does not accept Jesus Christ as my his Lord and Savior, he's going to die and go to hell. And I don't want Vincent Todd to go to hell. He's my friend. I love him. I want him to go to heaven. I want him to be there with me. It becomes urgent for me to get in contact with him, to see him, to share with him the hope that is in me. It, it expresses the necessity of us as believers to take this message that we have to a lost and dying world. Third thing we, we believe is we have a unique call. Each and every one of us. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 is just a mind-blowing portion of scripture when you begin to read it. In, in verse 18, it, it, it says, well, verse 21, it says, uh, you are ambassadors for Christ. I'm an ambassador. Well, what does that mean? It means I'm an official envoy of the kingdom of God. That, that's my job. That's my responsibility. I am, I, I, I'm a witness, and I have the title of an official envoy of the kingdom of God. Uh, we are diplomatic agents of the highest rank. We are resident representatives of heaven right here on earth. That's, that's what we believe. I believe that. It goes on to say that, that not only are we ambassadors, but that God has given to us the ministry and the word of reconciliation. You know what the word ministry means? Ministry means one who executes another person's plan. Ooh, I love that. One who executes another person's plan. I'm not out here dreaming up my own plan, but my responsibility is to execute the plan that was left for me. Well, what is the plan that was left for me? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded them until the end of the age. And Lord, I am with you even until the end. That's our responsibility as witnesses. We have a ministry and a word of reconciliation. The word reconciliation means to restore to a place of right relationship. God has done his part. God gave his son. His son gave his life. It's time for us, the church, to do our part. It's time for us to be witnesses. Come on, somebody. It's time for us to be who God says we are. Be an ambassador. Walk around with your head up high. Be a minister of reconciliation. Use the word of reconciliation that God has put in your heart and in your spirit. We are ministers of reconciliation. God is in us restoring the world unto himself. Third thing, what we do. Right, we, we know what we are. We are what? Witnesses. We are witnesses. We know what we believe. We believe that people matter to God. We believe that people have an eternal destination. And we believe that we have a unique calling. A unique calling. But what do we do? Just like Brother Sam preached this morning. We are witnesses who believe that people matter to God. And through the simple acts of everyday life, we draw people to Christ. Let me say it again. Y'all say it with me if you know it. We are witnesses who believe that people matter to God. And through the simple acts of everyday life, we draw people. Oh, let it get in your spirit. We are 
are witnesses who believe that people matter to God. And through the simple acts of everyday life, we draw. We are witnesses who believe that people matter to God. And through the simple acts of everyday life, we draw people to Christ. Well, how do we fulfill that? How do we translate that so it's not just words on a page or something that we memorize? <clears throat> Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father, which is in that. Well, how do I do that? I I'm going to give you some really practical ways that you can be a witness. Practical ways. Intentionally start relationships with unsaved people. Powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Powerful. Simple though. You know, the longer you're saved, the smaller your network of unsaved friends become. But intentionally start relationships with unsaved people. Why? So that you can be a witness. Intentionally. Well, just walk away. Hey, you know what? You've been on the job here for a number of years, and, and I've never known your name. What's your name? Sally. You look good, Sally. <laughs> Love the unlovely. You know, there are people out there that nobody cares about. People see them on the street, they pass by, and they look the other way. The downtrodden, the addicted. Love the unlovely. But not just the unlovely. Love the lovely too. You know, the folks who got it all together. Good folk. Good people. Take care of their families, two parent families, kids. You know, pay their kids college to it. They need to be loved into the kingdom too. Love the lovely. Pray on the spot for the trouble. You know, I learned that a long time ago. When someone asks me to pray for them, I don't wait till I get home because I'll probably forget. I just grab your hand right there. I said, let's pray right now. Pray for them. Well, the, the, a few nights ago, uh, of the quarter ministry, and I know they went out last night, uh, they just stood on the quarter and prayed for people. Just prayed for people. And people weep because someone loved them enough to approach them and to pray for them. Willing to touch their hand. Uh, love, they are lovely. Look, pray for people on the spot. Visit the sick. If you've got a neighbor that's sick, I mean that's really sick, well, you know, they are most vulnerable when they're sick. I've led more people to Christ on their uh, deathbeds than I've led people to Christ in everyday life. Our pastor used to send me to the hospital because he didn't like to see people sick. He'd send me, and I remember going into a room, this man was, was riddled with cancer, and he was, he was just on the, on the precipice of death. And I shared the good news of the gospel with him, and he bowed his head and his heart and asked Jesus to come into his life. And Jesus came in. Someone else went out to visit him the next day. They said he was glowing. Now, he died, but he died with Jesus. Mm. He died with Jesus. Go visit someone in the hospital. That's easy. Make a dozen cookies for a new neighbor that moves in the neighborhood. And go over to their house. Assure them there's no strict night in here. Just want to say hello. Or make some jollof rice. <laughs> and put some meat in it. Put some meat in it. Don't be stingy with the chicken. Put me be pieces of the chicken. I want some hooks. Take some jollof rice. Take it to your neighbor. Cook a full meal for those who are under duress. One of the things that Dave and Dan Mahavich have been so thankful for is that their network of friends have, have been there uh, for them while they've been at the hospital every day, bringing them meals and stopping by to visit and praying with them and, and for them. Cook a full meal for someone under duress. Shovel your neighbor's snow. I love it when my neighbors 
uh, snow, snow blowers break down. Because it's my opportunity to let my light shine. They, oh, no, no, no. I said, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Up and down. And it gives me an opportunity to be a witness. Break your neighbor's grass. Cut his grass. Be adventurous. Go next door and meet your neighbor. Have a barbecue on your deck and invite your neighbors. Just invite them. Say, hey, come on over. Sit down and talk with us. Just want to get to know you. Our next door neighbors, when we, when we were out there trying to do our, uh, uh, what do you call it? We were power washing our deck to get some of the, the stuff off. And I, my neighbor came over and gave me his power wash. And we used it. And I'm tempted to go buy my own, but, but if I do, he won't give me his again. <laughs> and I want to continue to build a relationship with him. I, I want to invite him over. You know, I want him and his wife and his dog to come over and sit on my deck and eat a brat and a burger, drink a soda, so that we can be a witness to them. Speak kind words to your co-workers. Worst witnesses in, in the world is, is someone that looks mean and grumpy all the time. <laughs> you know, got your lip all stuck out. Be nice. <laughs> Share with those in your circle of influence about the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. I want to close with this. I've been reading a book just recently called Refocus, and it's made me cry. It challenges the church because it suggests that the church has lost its way, that we've turned in on ourselves, and we've forgotten about the people outside the four walls of the church. And it challenges us that we need to refocus. Outside the four walls of the church, you know, we need to stop using the excuse that there's so many languages in this neighborhood we can't reach people. That's no barrier for God. We have a responsibility. We're planted here. This is our Jerusalem. And we have to touch our Jerusalem with the good news. I love that we get together on Sundays and have a great service. I do. I love worship. But I want to see some souls walk in the aisle. Amen. I don't want to see no church transfer growth. I'll take it if it comes. But I want to see souls. I want to see lost people find Jesus. It's our responsibility to do that. To be witnesses in a lost and dying world. Our responsibility. I, when I read that book, I repented. I repented. And, and I had to start thinking about myself. When was the last time I really established a relationship with someone that was lost? It's been a long time. When was the last time that I personally led someone to Christ? I can't remember. Scares me. Well, thus far and no further, we're going to refocus as a church. I, I don't expect you all to show up on Saturdays when I'm going to go out and knock on doors in this community and I'm going to meet people and I'm going to tell them about Jesus. But I do expect you, and God expects it of you even more so, that you become a witness in the circle where he has placed you. Time is short. And even if he doesn't come for another thousand years, it's short for people in your circle of influence. Some of them are on their way into a priceless eternity. 
Because we haven't shared our witness. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord God, that the challenge doesn't end with us loving you completely. That the challenge doesn't end with us learning to love ourselves and to see ourselves as you see us. Well, Lord, you said in your word, in the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Lord, we repent this morning. We repent, Lord God, of our indifference. We repent, Lord God, of our apathy. We repent this morning, Lord God, of our ease in Zion. Lord, forgive us for not being who you called us to be, witnesses. And help us, Lord, as we move forward to embrace the opportunity and the call to be witnesses for you. Help us to set aside our fears, our apprehensions, to talk about the Jesus who loved us so much that he gave the Son to redeem us. Father, we pray for boldness today. I pray for boldness across this congregation. Crown our heads with boldness. God, show us the fruit that is ripe, that is hanging from the tree. Help us, Lord God. Guide us. And then, Lord, when you show us, help us to pull the trigger. Help us to open our mouths and speak about the hope that lies within us. Father, we ask it in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus. Fill this place. Oh, God, fill this place with new believers. God, let the aisles run, Lord God, with those, Lord God, who have come, Lord God, as a result of our witness. God, when it's all said and done, we'll give you the praise. We'll give you the glory and we'll give you the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 We're going to ask the ushers to come. We're going to receive.